Welcome back to True Story with John Gibson. Uh, today's guest is, in my opinion, the most credible journalist in all the bodybuilding community, media, uh, Ron Harris. Hey, John. How are you? Thanks for having me. I'm great. I'm great. Thank you for coming on the show. Ron, you're also probably one of the hardest working men in, in bodybuilding. You uh, you pump out more content than anyone I've ever seen. But, uh, you know, as of recently, you've also, you know, attended a ton of contests and stuff. So you're super active. So I guess first and foremost, thank you for that, uh, you know, and finding the time again. Oh, yeah, you're very welcome. Yeah, it's, uh, this is the calm before the storm. We've got the Arnold and the Olympia coming up. So right now, it's okay. It's going to ramp up pretty, pretty hard in a couple of weeks, I'm sure. Yeah, absolutely. It's so exciting. It's, it's again, to your point, it's that time of year where I find myself on people's social media, like, like Sergio, seeing what they look like and check people out. And, uh, you know, it's the world's changed, but, uh, you know, and that gives me a, kind of a little bit of a segue where I was going with this, you know, it's so easy now to get that instantaneous kind of instant gratification, check people out, comment, reach out and, and kind of connect and all. But, um, where I sort of became, uh, I'll say, I don't know if, uh, yeah, I think a fan, you know, that's a, that's a fair word to use. A fan of yours is because you were kind of a competitor. Uh, you're a little older than me. I'm 38. So I was sort of looking up to you, following you kind of pre turning pro and stuff. And then you started becoming a contributor to the magazines in that era when that was super important. You know, there was maybe some forums, chat boards, but there was no internet like there is now. And, um, you know, anyway, I was just a kid who had a subscription to Flex and then Iron Mag and graduated to MD. And, and I felt like it went that way. And I uh, just always had appreciated your work. But I wanted to take a minute to kind of like get to know the guy behind the mic and sort of learn and kind of highlight a little bit about your personal bodybuilding journey first. And then maybe talk a little bit about, you know, how you've become this journalist. Like, how, how did that happen? You know, you've had this really credible career. Uh, so I guess let me start first from... Uh, were you like a teenage competitor? Did you start pretty young? Yeah, I did. My my first competition was March of 1989. I was still 19 at the time. Okay. Did another one in July. That year. So I did two competitions while I was still a teenager. Then I turned 20 that fall. And that was uh, the organization I started off with doesn't exist anymore. Mm. It was called ANBC, American Natural Bodybuilding Conference, uh, polygraph testing, and you were supposed to be natural for life. Wow. And I, that was my first few. And that was actually where I met uh, Tito Raymond, Jose's older brother. Yeah, I remember him. He was competing in that organization at the time. Wow. Yeah, it was, a, it was a really cool time for bodybuilding, late 80s, early 90s. Yeah. Hey, are, were you always from, or are you, have you always lived in Massachusetts in that area? Uh, I lived in Los Angeles area from January 1991 until late October 2000. Oh, whoa. So, okay. Interesting. So you definitely had a bad experience as well, but uh, I was asking that because, you know, during that time, your young years, you had Mike Monterazzo, you had Quadzilla, you know, you had some really cool talent there. Um, did you ever run into those guys? No, you know, they actually all came up while I was out in California, but the cool oh, thing wow. Was, <laughs> wow. Yeah. Uh, so I didn't, but you know, I was, I was able to be around the Venice beach scene from 91 through the, the rest of the nineties and everybody the cool thing was, it was it really was a mecca. Everybody from anywhere in the U.S. or Europe, a Middle East, wherever they would gravitate there. Yeah, they would yeah. come out there and do the the competitions. They would come out for photo shoots. Mm -hmm. So you got to see everybody. In fact, that's where I met. I never met Matarazzo in Boston. I met him in '91 when he came out to California, and that's where I met DeMeo for the first time. Was out in California. Wow. But uh, you're right, though. That was a great time for. Massachusetts bodybuilding, yeah. and bodybuilding in general. I mean, for sure. Man, ninety one was just a uh, uh, the national. Oh, I mean, you had a, yeah, you had Flex Wheeler in there. You know, it's this emerging pro with yeah, Matarazzo and all these young guys. It was super exciting and. Yeah, absolutely. It's so it's amazing that you were able to be in L.A. At, at, like at the Mecca during that time and live through that and also kind of competing. So what were your goal, goals like at that time? Were you just trying to turn pro? I mean, did you ever foresee that you would be a journalist in this industry like industry? Well, so uh, the reason I went out to California was uh, I was going to intern with a company called American Sports Network, who did. TV production work for ESPN. They had a monthly show called American Muscle Magazine. Yeah, I remember that. Awesome, man. So I, I was on, I was the associate producer of that show almost immediately because a couple of the older, more established guys, they were disgruntled and they quit. So I was sort of thrust into their wow. job. 
So I was able to do, you know, video shoots. I was directing training shoots, interviews. We were covering events like the, uh, the Arnold Classic, the Olympia, the USA. Yeah. So I was really privileged to be part of all that because we did that. That's how I met everybody. Everyone that I eventually became friends with, I met through my work on that show. And that's, if we'll get into the magazine, but that's how I trend. That's, that's how I got amazing. It. I had no idea. And I, man, I watched that. And as a kid, I watched like, because there was a lot of programming. And, and again, that launched the career guys, like, in my opinion, like Sean Ray, you know, he was on there doing the training stuff. And then you would get, uh, you know, Corey, or who is it? Corey Bow, like, you know, these, ra not random, but these other guys that I would never would have heard of otherwise. And all of a sudden they were superstars because now to me, they're on TV and in the magazine. Um, and they had a lot of programming, kind of like morning body shaping and stuff, right? They, they were yeah, they had, they had workout shows. Yeah. We had our show. There were, you know, we did event coverage specials for, you know, like one hour specials for the Mr. Olympia, the Ms. Olympia, the mm -hmm. USA. Another company did the Nationals. So there was a lot of bodybuilding on TV back then. Yeah, yeah. It's so it's so interesting how much it's changed uh, from that respect. Uh, so that's crazy. So after maybe, I guess, that show, uh, you know, concluded after that, um, you were still competing. I know that much because I was still following you all the way through the early 2000s and stuff. Um, when did you again make the transition? Were you just in L.A. and opportunities sort of presented themselves to, to write maybe? No, so what happened was it was early 92, I think January, uh, I went down to Iron Man Magazine's headquarters at the time was in Marina Del Rey. Mm. They later moved up state a little further north. But so that's where I met John Balick. Uh, yeah. Uh, he was the, uh, the uh, publisher, at the, the editor at the time, Steve Holman mm -hmm. and uh, Lonnie Teeper. The reason we were there was we were doing a preview segment for the next episode of the show on it was an Iron Man Pro preview, and Lonnie Teeper was talking about the lineup for the show. Mm -hmm. So while I was there, we also went in and did got some B-roll footage of the Iron Man magazine, the headquarters, and they had all the old magazines. I mean, it was really cool. Yeah, yeah. I, at one point, I pulled Steve Holman aside because I had already been writing scripts for the, the TV show this whole time. Uh, from the time I, the first day I was there, they had me writing scripts. Wow. So I said, Steve, um, you know, how does somebody get to write for your magazine? What, what could I submit something? Or he's like, yeah, if you want to submit something, you know, here's my, here's our fax number. Cause that's how you send things. <laughs> yeah. Back. Yeah. Wrote up a little something, faxed it. And he said, yeah, this is cool. We'll, we'll pay you a little bit for it. You'll, and I think I was in the magazine every month. I had something, uh, uh, an article, a column yeah. almost every month for about, hmm, I want to say about 15 years. So Iron Man, I got to give a lot of credit to Steve Holman and John Balick. They were the first people to publish me. Wow. That's really cool. But I mean, really influential people. I mean, wow. What, a, what an amazing break, you know, but you asked for it. That's really, that's actually a really cool story because you, you have not what you asked not, you know, so you asked for the opportunity and, and man, it's so crazy because growing up, uh, I'm 38 again. So the, I started getting in the magazines like at 13 through t my college years, 24, maybe 23, 24 after college. And when I got to Ironman, your column was really important because you would do Q and A's and stuff. And it was, it was, it wasn't as watered down as your reader, maybe your magazines at that time. It was a little bit more real, real life kind of practical information about dieting and stuff like that. Like you would talk about fats and stuff sometimes in nutrition mm -hmm. articles. No one was talking about that. Like uh -huh. uh, at that time, anyways, early stuff like that. So that that's really interesting. And then, uh, yeah, you say that uh, Lonnie Teeper too, what a character in the industry, what, a, what an important person and contributor. That's, that's amazing. What was it like to be a part of um, like the magazine rivalry, you know, maybe pre internet.com. Well, see, I luckily, because I was, uh, I didn't even become an employee of muscular development until 2017. So for many, many wow. years, You're for kidding. many years, no, I was independent. I was a freelance, you know, an independent contractor. So I used to write for everybody. There were many years where I would write for up to 15, 20 different publications, you know, wow. big and small ones. I did a ton of work for Bob Kennedy and Muscle Mag International. Mm. Uh, I have to give him a lot of thanks to the late Robert mm -hmm. Kennedy and uh, Gino. People know him as Johnny Fitness. They gave me a lot of work. Okay. Uh, and I did a ton of Planet Muscle, Jeff Everson. Oh, Planet Man. Muscle. Man, these are all coming back to me. Wow. I wrote a lot for Bill Phillips for Muscle Media 2000. Wow. which became testosterone and then teenage. Thing. Yeah. He was hardcore. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I did a tiny bit of writing for, I did one article for muscle and fitness. 
never wrote anything for flex but wow i was sort of on the sidelines of all these magazine rivalries because even though at at the time when flex and md were huge rivals Mm -hmm. i was still independent it was i was still writing for iron man and muscle mag so yeah did you ever get to a point where um like maybe you were just trying to pull back from competing and you uh, this is gonna be a weird question maybe (laughs) and uh but like i just feel like you know, you became a celebrity in our world, you know, in our sport, because you were interviewing everybody. And I mean, you were at the contest. It's, it blows my mind. You weren't a full-time employee of MD until 2017, because you had so much contest coverage. Like you were so active, uh, even as an independent, I guess, what, what I learned now. But I guess what I'm trying to ask is, is that like, you didn't need to be a, like, get a pro card and pursue the Olympia stage at some point, right? It was like, you're already totally immersed these are your friends these are your peers it's like did th- did that kind of dynamic ever change for you well i honestly i never even uh you know for many years pro car was never there was no way i was ever going to be a pro it was just that's like you know oh that wasn't your kind of that wasn't no, your that objective was, that wasn't my dream because you know i never saw i because i came up in an era where pro cards were very very hard to get and they were reserved for the best of the best. Yeah. You turn pro back when I started following the sport, if you were good enough to turn pro, like win the nationals, you were probably going to be top three or four at the Olympia that year or the next year. You were that good. Yeah. And there was only, when I started, all there was was men's bodybuilding, women's bodybuilding. There was nothing else. Right. There was, there was no fitness, bikini, figure, none of that. Men's yeah. physique. These things didn't exist yet. Right. So. The, I didn't start entertaining it. You know, I'm, I, I hope you realize I'm not a pro now, right? So, no, yeah, absolutely. I just, I always had assumed I was under the assumption you were chasing that pro card, you know, but, uh, and, and then you transitioned into journalism. Um, like, you, so it's, it's interesting to kind of get you, you know, get you to tell it in your own words. Yeah. The only, I didn't honestly start thinking about or thinking it was a possibility for me until I started competing in the Masters because they were giving out a lot of pro cards for masters mm-hmm. where in years past that, that wasn't a thing either. Right. Um, right. And, you know, once I started seeing a lot of the guys who I had beaten in previous competitions turning pro, I said, Hmm. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have, I don't want to make it clear. I don't think I'm entitled to a pro card. I don't think I have such a great physique that I need to be a pro, mm-hmm. but if they're giving out pro cards to all these other people and there are some of them that I know, I've beaten and I'm on stage. I could still beat them again. Well, I should, I, why wouldn't I want to be a pro yeah. too? Yeah. But there's, there's no rush. It's not a priority by any means at all. Yeah, yeah. sure. Sure. And it makes sense. Look, you're so busy. I couldn't imagine you trying to <laughs> find time to contest prep, uh, man. Well, to that end too. So here we are, right. And in, in kind of the, the most exciting time of this season, right. Going into the Arnold and then subsequently uh, Olympia. And there's still a lot of big names that need to qualify. Is there anybody maybe that you're keeping, um, you know, keeping an eye out for or looking forward to just at that we'll start at the Arnold. Maybe, you know, you have expectations for well, the, the qualifications are all done. You can't. Oh, I thought oh, we're all done. Okay. okay. Yeah, you can't qualify for the Olympia. It's all done, which they actually extended it later this year than they typically would have. Okay. But uh, yeah, it's going to be, the Arnold is going to be a great show. I'm really looking forward to Sergio Oliva Jr., William Bonac, Steve Kuklo, Roly Winkler. It's going to, geez, it's on and on. It's going to be almost as good a lineup as the Olympia. Of course, the Olympia, you have some people that won't do the Arnold, the big Rami, the champ, Hadi Chupan um geez we got uh, you know uh nick walker's doing both the young guy i'm excited yeah yeah that's gonna be exciting him i yeah the, the, a lot of you know it's gonna be a good lineup it is a really exciting line is brandon is is he competing in arnold brandon or is he gonna... uh brandon is not doing the arnold but he'll be back at the olympia okay uh, holling james holling said from uk is doing the olympia he's looking massive lately Big, yeah nathan de asher just qualified for the olympia a couple weeks ago oh, nice uh, nice game show he'll be in there it's yeah, I mean that that's our Super Bowl. That's yeah the whole year, the whole year leads up to that. And, yeah. Uh, you know who's really impressed me lately is yeah. Kluko, Steve Kluko. Mm-hmm. Like I slept on him. I you know, he came up, you know, he's very he's been very popular, obviously success, successful in and out of bodybuilding, both. But man, I saw him recently and I was like, whoa, like I just it's like I forgot about him. And uh he's an exciting one. 
Uh, Nick Walker is also exciting, new young blood, and and, and just you know, so uh, Hunter, Hunter Labrada, Ian Valier. I know I'm going to end up leaving a couple people. I know, out. shoot, right? Yeah, you don't want to hurt any feelings, but uh, this is just you talking as a fan, not as a journalist. This is yeah, uh, yeah no wrong answers here for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so so definitely a packed lineup from there. Um, what about you? You know, I mean, what's your kind of favorite part when you go there? Is it just your work hat and, and you have to get work or are you able to kind of also enjoy it as a fan? No, I can't enjoy it as a fan. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, you know, my, my position with MD, uh, is, is dual. I'm, I have two jobs. I'm the online editor and the senior writer, which were until I came along, those are two different people did that job. Okay. And I wow. still do a lot of the features, which was another job. So you could almost say it's three jobs. But mm -hmm. uh, at the contests, you know, my job as an online editor is to gather as much content as possible. Sure. As many interviews, as many. I'm actually, I've transitioned to, uh, you know, and when we were sitting there doing the play-by-play -play for, for years and years, I would just do the text commentary on the website, musculardevelopment.com. Mm -hmm. But now we have the capability to upload pictures instantly. So we always have professional photographers there. Like Jason Breeze is our, our guy at the Olympia usually. Mm -hmm. So he'll take the professional high resolution images and those take a couple hours to upload and get to, onto the website. But I take, I take pictures right on the iPhone and uh, we have a little chat room on WhatsApp for the MD coverage team. Oh, cool. uh, as I'm taking them, they put them right up there on the, on the website. Yeah. So, I'm basically a photographer now. Yeah. <laughs> now you got one more job. Yeah. Just, you know, I have this. I don't have like a $10,000 camera. Right. But I'll tell you, if you have a good seat and the lighting's good, the pictures come out pretty dang good. Yeah. Yeah. That's the yeah. thing that's changed the most since I got into this industry to now is the speed at which information is available. I mean, I can remember having to call up local gyms the day after the Mr. Olympia and say, do you guys know who the top five was the top 10? Wow. <laughs> but there, yeah. was no, there was no internet. Internet didn't exist. So you wouldn't yeah. see pictures of the Mr. Olympia in the magazines for six to eight weeks. So it's crazy. Yeah. Now it's, it's, it's now it's everything's instant. You have live streaming, you have pictures. Yeah. I mean, the fans are so spoiled now and I you know, I don't want to be that cranky old guy, but yeah. I struggle with it. No, because I understand I, I was on the end of your generation. Just, you know, I, I had internet, so I can't say I didn't have it, but it, it wasn't the same. And it definitely was it is what, what it is now. And I still remember having to like, so the Olympia, I could look up those results, but other magazines, the GNC pro, I had to wait till next month magazine to see who won that, you know, certain that, you know, that stuff wasn't really developed that infrastructure and early chat rooms, things like that. You had to almost know people to swap that information. So I, I'm, I'm sympathetic to what you're saying. And we are so spoiled and, and it, it's good and it's bad. I really struggle with it because I appreciate the opportunity to, to have a conversation like this. You know, it wouldn't, it couldn't have existed 10 years ago. I can connect with someone who was a stranger, you know, and, and pick your brain. But at the same time, there's so much bad information and it really, it's terrifying to me. Like, man, I never, not, you know, just like drugs, like saying, and we won't go deep into that, but like as someone, I did one bodybuilding show as an athlete, my whole life, you know, wrestling, BJ, all these things. I had a flex subscription. I didn't even really think about steroids and stuff to like college age. Didn't really get into my consciousness. And I still was like scared to ask someone like had to look around a gym for a big guy, feel him out for a month. <laughs> like it was not like an internet thing where a Boston Lloyd could say 3000 milligrams or something. I'm like, Oh my God, you know? So it's just like, I, I struggle with that because I'm a fan. I want this sport to always grow. You know, I want it to always thrive. And I, you know, the teenage thing didn't exist. I, I was a teenage competitor. Like it was exciting. I had a big class, you know, like, there was 10 of us, you know, which to me wasn't as big as I used to hear it was, but you know, me and nine other people showed up and trained for that. And uh, now it's like, they're not in bodybuilding, you know, those guys will go to physique or somewhere else maybe. Um, so I, I don't like that part either, but I, I'm also happy with the growth. Like, do you have any thoughts about kind of that random tangent I just laid on you? Yeah. You know, um, <clears throat> like I, rem I remember when the teenage classes, at, especially when I was out in California in the early nineties, I can remember a show like the Cal or the Orange County or the LA would have 20, 30 teenagers. They would have to divide it into, a 13 to 17 year old and 18, 19 year old groups. And it was, it was so popular with the young guys because yeah. they all wanted to be bodybuilders because there was nothing else to aspire to. Right. Even though 
it took, you know, it takes years to build all that muscle and build a, a, a really good bodybuilder type of physique mm-hmm. that didn't deter them because there wasn't any, there were no other options. Whereas right. now you have men's physique division, you know, most kids could look good enough, especially if they have decent genetics, most of them could look good enough a year, two years max to get on stage in board shorts, sure. class of physique, class of physique, maybe another year after that. Mm-hmm. Bodybuilding still takes longer. You know, the, it's interesting you talk about the, how drugs were such a, a taboo subject and there was so much mystique around them. And I think that was such a good thing compared to now where they're so accessible and, and there's so much awareness about them to the point where I think an entire generation of young men is convinced that you can't build any muscle or lose any fat without chemical assistance. I agree. So in our naivete uh, and our ignorance, we were so much better off. I know I was. Yes. Nobody told me you can't get big or strong without steroids. And I didn't know that. So I got a lot bigger and stronger. Yeah. Years later, when I put steroids into the mix, I got even bigger and stronger. Right. Right. But some of my favorite memories along this kind of, I'll say, bodybuilding journey were like getting Larry Scott's arm routine. And I'm totally natural, never thought about a steroid. And I'm killing myself on these bicep things and doing 100 reps in my in my bedroom, you know, and getting the biggest pump of my life, you know, and feeling like this is all, you know, like those individual moments were like how I fell in love with that sport, you know. And, and to your point, so a generation of young guys think like, you need one to do the other, like they get it with the gym membership, which is crazy to me. It's like, you have no idea how much potential you actually have and, and fall in love with it first, fall in love with that, you know, that feeling, that mind muscle connection before you ever would think, you know, I don't know, you know, it's, it's kind of double-edged sword, I guess the the information out there. Well, social media, I'll I'll say, obviously social media has a lot of good sides to it. Mm -hmm. You know, you can market, promote yourself, your business. There's, There's a lot of, they're just a, the, the, it's 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 got a lot of positives to it but one thing i do see is there's a large group of men and women who only train i should say to be able to get validation and recognition for it and they don't even want they don't train for the love of it you can it's it's obvious to me mm-hmm. if there was no instagram no youtube I, I i'm sure a lot of them wouldn't even bother going to the gym Right, right, because they're doing it for the attention and for the likes and the, the mm-hmm. views and the clicks and all that. But you know, well, we'll it's over. I, I think another reason why I appreciate you and kind of guys like Bob Chicarello and some of these other guys is because you stood the test of time. Uh, to that point, I've seen so in my just as a fan, I've seen so many burnouts. People come and go, so many. <laughs> I wouldn't dare start naming names, and I'm sure you've seen more, you know. And uh, so those people that actually last, and, and what I think is really kind of cool about the way you contribute to the sport is, um, we don't have a lot of modern day like historians left, you know. And I think Peter McGuff, when he passed away, we really lost a really important person because, man, what an influential voice, and he he had just such hit, so much history, right. And so much knowledge. So, you know, we need guys kind of like, and, and, and in my opinion, there's like guys like you again, Bob Chigarell, even Sean Ray, you know, people that can just reference these things and they're sharp, you know, uh, as a fan, because it's, it, it's not all about the board shorts. Again, we should remember our history and roots and, and appreciate that. So again, I think like you've been a big part of that, you know, you've interviewed people at the national level, pro level for over maybe two decades. Is that fair to say? I mean, since the early nineties, more longer. If you, right? if you include the TV show, American muscle, uh, it's 30, it's, it's over 30 years now I've been doing this. Wow. Yeah. So man, that's, a, that's amazing. So what, what do you think? Like, so from a personal perspective and you don't have to go too deep, but like, um, you know, you, you're married and kids, you've always, like, you have kids and grown kids, right. You've always kind of uh, talked about them and referenced that if you're like a family guy and, and I've appreciated that about you too, man. So this journey, did you, did you ever expect 20, 30 years ago, like you'd have this whole bodybuilding life? No, no. I mean, I went to college for film. Oh, wow. Some vague notion of being a movie director or something. And it wasn't really, I didn't know what the hell I was going to do with my life, but yeah, that's- sure. That's that's what I went to college for was film, and um, I didn't. I never planned on working in the bodybuilding industry, I, even though by from my first semester of college in fall of '87, I was already just started to read the magazines, and I was getting obsessed and fell in love with the sport. Yeah. But I never, I never saw that as any kind of career path. I always assumed that would be, 
you know, a hobby and I was going to devote my life to building my body and everything, but it would always be something separate from work. I never imagined it would meld into one, one thing the way that it did. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's amazing. Things work out. Okay. I'll leave you kind of with this last question here. Is there any moment kind of uh, like a surreal moment, like where you interviewed somebody or met someone and you just even had, had to kind of as a fan moment, be like, is this Lee Haney right now? Or somebody just crazy. Have you ever had sort of that outer body moment where you thought like, you know, this is just, this is crazy. Uh, well, as far as interviews, I'd say the, the one interview that was surreal for me, and it was over the phone. Unfortunately, it wasn't Zoom. He couldn't see me, and I couldn't see him. It was Arnold Schwarzenegger. Oh, that'll do it, though. <laughs> I mean, it's got to be number one, right? It doesn't, it doesn't get more iconic than that. No, of course not. Yeah. As far as experiences, I would say I was fortunate enough to train with a, 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 few, a few champions. I did a leg workout with Ronnie Coleman back in 2005. 2010, I did a leg workout in Temple Gym, Birmingham, England, with Dorian Yates. Wow! So those two, and I worked out with I've worked out with a, a lot of other pros, but those are the two that really I'll never. And a Brent, you know, Brent, the Branch Warren leg workout was wow. It's always legs. It was always yeah. Legs. I was about to say, <laughs> that's so funny you say that. <clears throat> Excuse me, because uh, shortly after the pandemic started, you you would either film or posted a, a at home leg workout with dumbbells, <laughs> dude. Ron, I've done that workout. <laughs> 20 times i was like that's a good idea i've like literally done that so yeah you and your legs those big quads yeah, that's crazy. But those two experiences were probably the most memorable just because you know i was lucky enough to to do train legs with ronnie at metroflex gym and it was the last year he was still the reigning mr olympia champ that would be 2005 would be his last win so he was already a seven-time champ by then and man we did the parking lunges out uh, parking wow. lot lunges it was it was pouring rain and we were like all wet and muddy and disgusting, wow. but man, I wouldn't trade that for the world. And Dorian, it was in that gym where he trained for all of his Olympia wins and everything else. That gym is no longer there, that yeah. temple gym, but it was a real dungeon. It was just, yeah, so I, I imagine it being tiny. Yeah. Just, it was, it was, it was claustrophobic. It felt like it was somebody's extended basement, you know, with the old stone crumbling walls yeah. and yeah. smelled like mildew and mold. Yeah man wow yeah i That's watched cool. that video a million times him and his training partner his trainer screaming in his face or, or the or uh, chris cormier going uh puking outside <laughs> that, that's amazing those are amazing experiences ron that's amazing and to your point too ronnie was had to be like 300 pounds back then that was him huge yeah it was crazy because he had just he was just coming back you know he used to take a, a full three months off of training after the olympias wow. so this was february he had only been back training for like five weeks or something at that point he was well over 300 pounds already and yeah yeah he was playing with weights that none of us could even could even yeah, yeah. but I, I do remember one thing as i've never i never did it before and i never did it again front squats were never my thing i was they're just i always felt like i was being choked out or something with the yeah block. and I, you know 315 was very very heavy for me on front squats but that day I did a set with 405 with Ronnie behind me screaming. And I don't know how I did it without, <laughs> without tearing anything. And I never did it after that either. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. just goes to show you how much the mind really plays into all this. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's incredible. Well, yeah. It really is incredible what you can yeah, achieve well, physically. Yeah. I'm going to punk out in front of Ronnie Coleman, you know? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah, hey, you had the best spotter in the gym, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. Wow. That's amazing. Aran, thank you again. This, this was really my pleasure. I, I appreciate you so much uh, coming on the show. And of course I'll be watching all the upcoming content. Um, where can people reach you? What's the best place to follow you uh, for oh. contact uh, or excuse me, for contest uh, information and to reach out to you uh, personally. Okay. So my, my Instagram is at Ron Harris muscle. Okay. At Ron Harris muscle. That's me with a muscle at the end. Uh, you can check out the YouTube channel. It's muscular development. Uh, we're currently uh, putting out all kinds of interviews. You know, we have, I do the Ron line report. Uh, my associate, good friend, Giles, Th Giles Thomas does MD global muscle weekly show. And is uh, he's got a couple lovely ladies that do the buff bombshell show. Yeah. So we have a lot of content. And once we get to a contest, obviously it's stage right. videos, interviews, all kinds of cool stuff. So right. muscle yeah. development and muscle development.com. We still have our website with a very active forum the noble forum with different threads where people argue and debate yeah, yeah. yell at each other it's pretty fun 
Yeah. Awesome. And I'll include all those links uh, here as well in the clip. Uh, Ron, again, my pleasure. This is True Story, John Gibson, Ron Harris. Thank you. Thank you, man.